Well, good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. This is not at all part of my teaching, so I don't know. Watch out for future pastors slash pastors that uh, when they digress here. But I just feel like the Lord was saying to me, "There is. I am convinced there is no other way to live Amen. than to be submitted to Jesus Christ. Amen. To have Jesus Christ in your life, to have to be a part of that, to have... A relationship with him I, maybe this is for somebody watching or somebody here but we can't trust in riches we can't trust in health because those things can fail right Amen. we can't trust in we can you know family's awesome but family might not always be there but one thing I'm sure of is the Lord is always going to be there the Lord will always be with us Friends are great, but sometimes friends move, Amen. or friends pass away, or godly leaders pass away, right? Yeah. But I'm convinced there is no other way to live except through Jesus Christ. Let that be on record for whoever may watch this one day. When I'm gone one day, maybe, <laughs> you know, one day. That I am convinced that there is no other way to live except in Jesus Christ. Amen. And his healing and his love and his forgiveness and his life and his light. So that was for free. I don't know. <laughs> I just feel like the Lord was uh, putting that on my heart. So um, a couple of things. I, I thought it was good that uh, Pastor Wayne gave props last week. I forget who you, you got it out of the Bible I think it was your notes or something like that that you were sharing to give uh, props or to give due to uh, credit to who is due. And um, this teaching uh, that I'm going to share with you is actually from, I'm taking uh, pastoral classes. It's New Testament survey. Uh, it's, a new, it's called a New Testament survey. It's one of the classes that I'm taking. Um, it's from Global University. So I just wanted to give credit to where credit is due, some of the information. Um, I am amazed by how deliberate God is in his word and how everything in the Bible got guided by his hand. Like um, who, had, who he had write the different books of the Bible or the Gospels or uh, in the New Testament, the Old Testament, who he chose and the experiences that they had. And, and the more and more I read, the more I marvel at how God deliberate was, he was, and how he used people to write the, the Word of God. And it's just really amazing to me. Um, you know, I always uh, pick, I don't want to nerd out on you guys today, but I did, I, I am reading this, and I think it's important for us to continually to learn about the Word of God, to, to, to buy about the Bible, and to continue, obviously, to, to get more and more. Uh, we can't just rely on what we've already learned. I think it's important for us to continue to, to learn new things. And when I was reading, I, I, I guess I'm a bit of a nerd, I, I get excited about these things. Hopefully I can kind of relay the excitement to you about the things that I've been learning. Um, and, and, this, and this teaching is a closer look at the Gospels. So the title of this is a closer look at the Gospels, kind of an emphasis uh, Matthew, Mark, and, or a, a teaching on Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but more of an emphasis on John um, and some of the difference and things like that with it. So um, hopefully I don't lose you in uh, some of my nerdism um, in this, but I am excited about God's word. And uh, I'm just looking at my son Luke with his little elephant mask on. Just threw me off. So, um, but anyway, I'm excited about <laughs> God's word and what he has. Um, I always believed, like, you know, when I was a young Christian or young uh, child, that I believed, like, the Word of God, where did it come from? Like, like how was it written? And I always picture, like, God was like, Oh, the Word of God, glory to God in the highest, the Word of God, amen. You know, like, and then, like, it was like this, you know. Like it just like came and floated down and then, or, you know, or, or, or the men of God were like robots, you know, like and write the word of God, you know, just like completely like possessed, you know, by the spirit of God. Like, it, and, and in fact, obviously that's not what happened. Um, 
I guess God could have literally wrote it, you know, like what he did with the, the second time with the Ten Commandments with the finger of God, right? I do believe, obviously, the Word of God is inspired and God breathed. It says it in the Scriptures. I believe in the Scriptures. Um, but he could have done that. But I think God loves us so much that he wanted to be us up to, for us to be a part of that. He wanted us to write his story. He loved us so much. He always wants to be involved with us now and also with the writing of, his, of the word. Okay, so like he could have he could have done it himself. Amen. He could have written the word of God himself and then just said, OK, here it is. You know, like, you know, but he did it. He used different men um, from different backgrounds um, to tell his story, tell the story of how mankind lived with him and worked with him throughout history. And he chose men to choose mankind to write the story. And I thought that was really cool because he, he really wants to be a part of our life. Think about it. That's why he came down here, right? God came in the form of man to live amongst us. What other faith can say that? What other religion can say that? That God loved us so much that he came in the form of man, a baby, and then uh, lived with us, perfect life, died, resurrected, and, that, and, and he can relate to all of the things that we've been through. He can relate because he's, he's been there. It's just amazing. God, so God uses people, God used men of God to write this word. And I think that's really cool. Um, I also always thought that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were all written about the same time. So, you know, they're the first four books of the Bible, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. They're all written at the same time. And primarily had the same message, you know. You know, they're pretty much the same. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay, you know, they're talking about Jesus. They're the, like the ones that talk about the biography um, of Jesus, right? But a closer study tells us that each gospel was written years apart. They were written years apart. Had a different purpose and a different audience. And this is where I'm gonna nerd out on you a little bit, so just bear with me. We call Matthew, Mark, and Luke the synoptic, it's again, synoptic gospels, which means seeing together, because they look at the ministry and teachings of Christ from similar points of view. So you can kind of lump, out of the four gospels, you can lump Matthew, Mark, and Luke together. They're called the synoptic gospels because they, they show Christ and uh, they have different purposes, but they're kind of lumped together. That's why they're called the Synoptic Gospels. <clears throat> they tell similar stories about Jesus' life and present him from a different perspective than John does. So John has a different purpose. Many times people want to point out discrepancies or differences in the, in, in the Gospels. Why do they want to do that? You might find yourself in college, future uh, young people over here and those that are watching, taking a religious or philosophy course, and the professor might attempt to use these differences to try and disprove the Bible's accuracy. So they'll want to try, like they'll say, oh, this was said in Matthew, but then Jesus said it this. Which, what, which was it then? Or did he say it at all? Is Jesus real at all? You know, and, and they'll try to shake you up. And I remember these different things when I took different history classes or religious classes, you know, things like that. Or somebody that you might know say, well, the Bible has these inconsistencies. And then that might make you scared. It may be defensive. You're like, oh, no, what's is the Bible real? Is, is this accurate? Let me give you an example of maybe one of these discrepancies you might hear. It says, in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus is quoted saying... And this is Luke. Hi, Luke. Blessed are the poor, but Matthew, I'm sorry, blessed are the poor. So Jesus is quoted saying, blessed are the poor. But Matthew records him saying, blessed are the poor in spirit. So how can Jesus say two different things? Now, it could be that Jesus said both of these things at different times. That's a possibility that he said he did say both of these things at different times. But it's also likely, likely that Matthew felt it was extremely important to clearly communicate the spiritual, the spiritual significance of Jesus' words. So there was a different reason why Matthew said it that way, 
or emphasized that way versus Luke said it another way. There was maybe a different audience or a different purpose for it. So it's not something to be shaken up about. Okay? Because what it is is when they talk about the discrepancies, they really don't know the word of God. So if we can learn the word of God at a deeper level, we can have more confidence. And I can tell you that you can have confidence in the word of God if you look deep enough. There are always the answers to these questions. So you, I might not know all the answers to the questions you might know, but there, there are some smart scholars on the word of God that you can learn about. And that's kind of like what I got excited about when I was doing this study. There, God's word is very reliable. And those professors or those people that come to you really have a very limited understanding. If they're bringing that argument up to you, they really don't truly know the word of God. They really don't. And they don't definitely have a relationship with Jesus Christ. So you can rely on that. <clears throat> so there are some differences, but that isn't a reason to panic, like I said, to lose your confidence in the scriptures. And I want to point this out. Just like in an investigation, so I'd have to uh, defer to Pastor Wayne on here. Just like an investigation of a crime, if everyone has exactly the same story, it appears more scripted and not real. A, detect a detective might know or become skeptical because there weren't any subtle differences in people's accounts. So it would be kind of like if there was a crime committed and there was a couple of us that were there, you know, we get together and hurry up and get our stories right. And we all tell exactly the same lie. And a detective is trained to know, to detect that. If everything's exactly the same, something's up. Just like in the word of God, if everything was exactly the same, something's up. Yeah, they didn't confer with one another. That makes it more val valid, not doubting. Okay? <clears throat> Why is the why are there these discrepancies? Because people are different. One, we notice different things when, a, when an, uh, an occurrence happens. There's different cultural experiences, different occupations. Something that a teacher might observe than maybe a welder would observe, or a, a lawyer might observe or pick up on. These occupations stress different things because they they have different life experiences, so they bring that to the table. A slight variation, again, I said this already. A slight variation in someone's testimony compared to another's adds validity. It adds validity. Not doubt to what actually occurred. Not doubt to what actually occurred. I don't need help, but uh, you got you definitely have tools. I like I like it. Nice blower. The the only help I need is you explaining why you have that. Because it's my birthday. It's his birthday. <laughs> Thank you. I'm good. Thank you. Have a great day. Have a great day. Thanks, man. You need me. All right. Give it up for Brad. All right. <laughs> what just happened? That was random. No, it wasn't. That was awesome. You liked it? I got your attention. So that's something you won't remember my word, but you'll remember that probably. So that's good. That's good. So I'm going to ask for a little audience for, uh, participation now. Okay. I need. Somebody tell me exactly what you observed. Be brave. Tell me exactly what you observed. Tell me exactly what you observed. All right, TJ, go through and tell me exactly what you observed. Um, so he has the two belt. Okay. And then he has an umbrella hat that has yellow and white. Mm-hmm. Okay. Birthday hat, not a princess hat. And it sings. The one that sings? Yeah. Okay. 
And Ali Plover that he blew in your face. Okay. And I did tell him to do that. Yeah, you're welcome. Someone else? Uh, Christina. So I observed my brother in law acting very strange. Like out of his character. With very strange objects attached to him. Very good, very good. Anyone else? Give me some, one more person. Give me an observation. Paula. Um, I saw Brad walking around showing a maintenance man and like, he like, need help with a blower and a teddy bear and an umbrella hat and lights. Oh, yeah. Amen. <laughs> Karen? Uh, the first thing I noticed was, was the lights, the bright, like, sparkly lights. Oh, and his, oh, and his uh, so he had the, yeah. his favorite uh, Christmas, Christmas light bulbs, yeah. yeah. Busted them out. All right. So... We've got about four different testimonies. Oh, we have four different Gospels, don't we? Hmm. All right. Wait a minute. Didn't we all observe the same thing? But did everybody's account exactly match? Does that mean it didn't happen? So just because we had different accounts or different testimonies of something happening, does that mean it didn't happen? So everybody did not say the exact same thing. If everybody said the same exact thing, I would be either one impressed or very skeptical, skeptical like I said about the uh, detective. Okay, do you see what I'm saying? So it's okay if there are differences in the, the gospel. We can still trust in it. Do you see what I'm saying? There was different reasons people stressed different things. Christina has a different relationship with Brad than us. That's, his, that's her brother-in-law, right? So she came at it with a different perspective. She said this was out of his character as well, if you heard that. It was out of his character. So the different uh, maybe disciples of Jesus or followers of Jesus, they also probably had different perspectives of, of Jesus, right? They were human beings, not robots, right? They had different occupations. They, had diff they came from, some were Greek, some were uh, Jewish. They, were, they did, had different heritage different languages same thing but we can trust in the, the actual events that occurred and there's also other reasons why they stress what they did because they had different audiences when they wrote it so we don't have to be afraid if there are differences in the bible i know that was kind of a silly thing to, to do thank you brad for your willingness to do that i knew brad would be willing yeah give him a round of very good acting school all right so but hopefully you're getting my point just because there are subtle differences doesn't mean it's not true. Actually, I, I would hope there'd be different. If they were all the same and you had different authors, that would be strange. If everything had matched exactly. Right. Anyway, I just wanted to, to kind of give you that confidence in the Word of God. And now I'm going to go in. I might nerd, nerd out a little bit on the different Gospels. And I want to stress why there are some differences in the in the gospels but before i want to i want to identify the gospel i want to i mean i'm going to i want to um give a definition of, of the gospel it says the word gospel means good message or good news that's what gospel means so if you're wondering why are they called the, the gospels it's because it, they literally mean good news they're a good message now it doesn't the gospel the word gospel doesn't just apply to the bible has anyone like, oh, this was probably like for the older generation, I, I remember this and my age and I'll probably, someone might have come up to you and said, what's the good news? Yeah. I don't know if they've ever heard that. They don't use that word and use anymore. And, and I remember as a young Christian, like Kathy said, you know, on fire, like just any opportunity to share Jesus. Um, someone would come up to me at, when I was working at the horror store and, a guy, and it was an older uh, guy and he said, what's the good news? I said, well, Jesus died for your sins. And he's like, you know, you know, he was just wanted to know like what's up, you know. But I just boom right between the eyes, you know. So that so that's the God, that's the good news. He wants to know what the good news is. Come in, God, you're gonna, gonna, I can't help myself if someone asks me what the good news is. So the, the the gospel has a rich background in the Old Testament. The basic meaning of the term gospel was simply an announcement of a good message. That's all it means. A good, it's a good message. So, for example, if a doctor came to examine a sick person and afterward declared that the problem was nothing serious, that was gospel. 
That was gospel. That was gospel. That was good news. Okay? That was the gospel. In ancient days, when soldiers went out to battle, people waited breathlessly for a report from the battlefield about the outcome. Once the outcome was known, a marathon runner, there you go, you, now there's a purpose for marathon runners. I'm not sure why people run marathons, but it's okay. Marathon runners dashed back to give the report after a battle. That is why Isaiah, if you can find it in the book of Isaiah, says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. That's the gospel. The watchman in the watchtower would look as, is, as far as the eye could see into the distance. Finally, you would see the dust moving as the runner sped back to the city to give the report of the battle. The watchmen were trained. So the watchmen, the people watching the sea, you know, they didn't have phones back then, you know, uh, or the telegraph or anything like that. So the watchmen on the wall were looking way out to see what's going on. They were trained to tell by the way the runner's legs were churning whether the news was good or bad. So if the runner was doing the survival shuffle, <laughs> it was bad news. It was bad news. You're like, he's destroyed. The, we have bad news. Like, right away, he could declare that. Or even before the guy gets to the, the place, he's like, oh, no. Something bad really happened. But if the runner is running in the and the, and, the, and the sand is kicking high, and he's running confidently. He knows he has a good report. He has good news. He has the gospel. And that's where that derived from, if you ever wondered where, why they call it the gospel. So I thought it was a good idea to kind of give you a background on what gospel meant. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are called gospels, obviously, because they contain the good news or report of what Jesus Christ has done. So when we share the gospel, I read something once. When you share the gospel, when someone says they share the gospel, what that really means of Jesus Christ, you're sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, of what he's done. You can share your testimony of what he's done through you, and, and he, but the gospel is really the, you know, the word of God and what has actually happened with him. So it's a slight difference. But the gospel, when you talk about the gospel, when I preach on the gospel, you're preaching on Jesus and what, he, what he's done. <clears throat> now, I want to focus on the different Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, kind of in a short way, just a cursory look at them, and why they are, there's some subtle differences in them. <clears throat> so let's focus on uh, the Gospel of Matthew first. And I thought this was kind of cool, again, because God used different men to write these Gospels because there was a different audience for each one. The Gospel of Matthew's target audience was the Jews. So Matthew wrote to address the Jews specifically. Persuading them that Jesus is the Messiah. The King of the Jews. Now how did Matthew do that? Well, God used Matthew, first of all, who was a Jew. Who knew the Jewish customs. Had knew the Jewish uh, culture to be able to write this book. So he chose, it's awesome, he chose somebody that came from a specific background to write that book. <clears throat> he was one of the original disciples of Jesus. And Matthew focused on Jesus being the savior to the Jews. In Matthew, there are a lot of Old Testament, so in Matthew you'll find a lot of Old Testament quotes and genealogy that the genealogy, that this is kind of cool, I thought this was neat. In Matthew, they, they, uh, the genealogy goes back to Abraham and David. Why? Because that's why the, Jew, the Jews could connect to that. Do you see what I'm saying? That's why he goes back to that. He goes back to Abraham and, and David, and he uses Old Testament prophecies to give relevance of why Jesus is the Messiah. So he's talking to the, uh, the Jews, and he's using what the Jews could connect with genealogy to Abraham, because that was very important to them, and David, right? It is also worth, this is kind of cool, it is also worth noting that the kingdom of heaven, in Matthew they use the word kingdom of heaven 33 times, rather than the kingdom of God. So it doesn't use the kingdom of God, he uses the word kingdom of heaven. You go, so what? Well, this is because the word of God was considered too holy for Jews to mention. So it wouldn't put them off. 
Do you see what I'm saying? By him saying the kingdom of heaven, they knew what he meant. It was a replacement for the word kingdom of God. So it would, it would be able to appeal to them and not put them off and not be a stumbling block for them. Because, it, you know, the, the God's word is holy, right? We shouldn't take the Lord's name in vain. And they took that to a real extreme level whenever they said it. You know, only, certain, only the high priest at certain times of the year could use the name God. So that's why in Matthew they talk about the kingdom of heaven. So that's Matthew. Now, let's focus on, so again, Matthew's for the Jew, the, was the, audience, the primary audience was the Jews, and obviously we benefit from this book as well, but that's why that was written that way. The Gospel of Mark's target, target audience was the Romans, explaining that Jesus is the servant of the Lord, busy working. So that would appeal to the Romans. Church tradition points to John Mark as the author of the Gospel, Mark was not one of the original 12 disciples. So again, a difference right there. He was a friend of Peter and worked closely with Paul. So they, were, they had friendships, those two. The Gospel of Mark gives no genealogy. So see that, that wasn't important to the Romans. So he doesn't include the genealogy. So you, that's why, if you're wondering, why do some of them have genealogies or going, like the heritage, you know, like the one that you guys like to skip, like I like to skip all the names, you know. <laughs> well, I can't say all the names, so I'm just going to go through. Right? So, but Rome and Romans, that's not important. So they don't include it. So if you like to skip the genealogy, just read the book, uh, Gospel of Mark. <laughs> you don't have to go through all that. Um... The Gospel of Mark gives no genealogy. Instead, he focuses on Christ being active. 42 times we see Christ doing things immediately. So he really focuses on Christ, the things that he was doing, which again could relate to the Romans. This showed the Romans that Jesus, as the Son, was actively serving the Father. So that's something they could relate to. So they, he, they focused on Jesus being the Son of God, actively doing the, the will of the Father. And just for, again, nerdism, if this is important to you, Mark was the first gospel written. So that was one of the first. So it's not an order like, that, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, like that. So Mark was one of the, is the first book written. <clears throat> now to go on to the gospel of Luke. Luke's target audience were the Greeks. Again, it's cool. God cared enough about each group, didn't he? To have a specific person write to those people. Explain that Jesus is the son of man, the perfect human. So Greek, at the time, the Greece was very focused on the perfect human. Like, like, the, the, like the, the perfect specimen, you know, you know, the perfect specimen. So that's what he kind of, that's what, that's what Luke's focused on. Luke was also Greek who wrote for the Greeks. Again, diversity in God's word. The main purpose is to present Jesus as the Savior of all. Amen. Luke emphasized Jesus the Savior to all. Like Matthew, Luke includes a genealogy, but I like this. Again, I'm nerding out on you. But Luke traces Christ's gene genealogy all the way back to Adam. Yeah. So it doesn't focus on going back to Abraham or David. He goes all the way back to Adam. Why? Because he wants to say he's the Savior to all men. We are all related. We all go back to Adam. We all fall short of the glory of God. We all have sinned because of the original sin. We all can trace our, 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 we are all connected back to Adam. And therefore we all need this Savior Jesus. Now I'd like to move on to the Gospel of John because it's a separate, like I said, they're all the Gospels, but John has sort of a different purpose. And I thought this was pretty interesting. John was an original disciple of Jesus. He was a fisherman, a son of Zebedee, and the brother's brother of James, and also known as the Sons of Thunder. Sons of Thunder. <laughs> when Jesus called him, he was about 25 years old. Some scholars say he was a teenager. So again, church history, you have to look at it. But this guy was young. He was a young disciple. And a spunky one, apparently, too. And a spitfire. Right, Kathy? 
John was one of the closest disciples to Jesus. Several times the fourth gospel refers to him as the disciple whom Jesus loved. I would like that title, the disciple that Jesus loved. Man, that'd be awesome. The Gospel of John, this was surprising to me, the Gospel of John was written between AD 80 to 95, around that range, several years after the writing of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. This is roughly 50 to 60 years after Christ's resurrection. So John's Gospel was written almost 50 years after Christ was resurrected. So you've got a, a mature man now, right? If he was, say, 20 years old, and then you say six years, the guy's around 80 years old, right, in this gospel. Not the same guy. Jesus changed his life, right? Not the same man. Not the one called down thunder upon the sinners anymore. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall have eternal life, right? Love. Disciple of love by that time. Softened up, astronized. <laughs> In fact, the Gospel of John was one of the last books of the New Testament to be written. So you might be kind of confused. John is one of the last books of the New Testament. All the other books, all the things that we read, read in the New Testament, transpire, acts, the Holy Spirit, all these things, the Gospel being shared all throughout the world, already happened. All these things, people knew the name of Jesus. It was spread, the disciples. All those things have occurred. Then John writes this gospel. Later. Later on. Why? Why would he wait so long? Or why did he do it then? So late. And there's a reason. That's why I love God and his word is good. The, the events of Christ were well established. Why, why write another gospel? One reason was that false teachers had begun attacking, attacking the gospel. False teachers. It started, there was a rise of false teachers coming up in the first century after Christ. They were denied that Jesus was the Son of God who came in the flesh. There was a school of thought attacking the divinity of Jesus. The divinity that, God, that Jesus was God. Not that Jesus... They believed that Jesus existed because they there was too much evidence for that. But what they were doing was they were they were um, attacking the idea that he was God. Exactly. I know it's stunning. I know. I know. It's, it got me shaken up too. There arose in the first century this idea of Gnosticism, and my good Catholic wife, she went to Catholic school, so she knew what Gnosticism. I was like, man. Well, the Catholic school paid off there. So Gnosticism is the idea of like, not where we get the idea of knowledge, Gnosticism, where that's where that comes from. And it's having, it means having knowledge. So many Gnostic texts deal not in concepts of sin and repentance. So again, this is a little heady, but with illusion and enlightenment. So this idea of enlightenment, a head knowledge faith, a head knowledge faith. And there was this dude named Serenthus, the dude, Serenthus, who was a prominent man at the time who followed this idea of Gnosticism, and he was considered a heretic to the early church fathers. So John considered him a heretic, and so were many other disciples and followers of Christ. Contrary to the church fathers, he used the gospel of Serenthus. He got to write his own gospel. And denied that, now this is a little tricky, you got to listen to this. And denied that the supreme God made the physical world. So he's denying that Jesus came, he, he, he said Jesus was here, but he's denying that God came in the flesh. Emmanuel, right? He's denying that. What he says, again, in Sarathus' interpretation, that Christ was anointed... <coughs> The Christ was anointed one, one descended upon the human Jesus. So like, so Jesus was born. But what, what Serenthus is saying is the Christ, God, came upon Jesus when he was baptized. Okay? Very subtle. But like, like God's spirit came upon Jesus when he was baptized by John. 
He wasn't always God, but the Spirit came upon him at that point. Sounds somewhat like the devil to me. <laughs> like, not like Jesus is not God, like, but it was like, okay, oh, he, he became God when God came upon him, like, he, to do the works of God. Subtle things, right? God's not, or the devil's not as blatant. He tries to be a little tricky here. So it says, and, and this baptism, when the Christ or God descended upon Jesus, it guided him in ministry and the performing of miracles. So God fell upon Jesus and allowed him to do these miracles, but left him at crucifixion. You know, when he says, you know, I give up my spirit. So he interprets it that way. And then similar, he maintains that Jesus was not born of a virgin, but was a mere man, the biological son of Mary and Joseph. So he was actually the son of Joseph as well, not of the Holy Spirit. So obviously John did not like this guy. <laughs> Church history says that they were like at a bathhouse or something, and the like he came, in, the Serenthus came in, and John's like, "Huh, here he is, the the the, the heretic, the the one who peddles false uh, teachings. Watch out, everyone! Hide your uh, your wives and your daughters. Hide, hide your sons from this guy's teaching. Like he, he you know, he, he did not like this guy. And church, according to church history, not in the Bible, but you know, we can gain some background from that. So obviously." That's why John writes this book, obviously for us as well, but to address these heresies, these lies about Jesus not being the Son of God, not being God. Um, John wanted to set the record straight. John presented Jesus as the Son of God. In the book of John, Jesus not only refers to God as my Father 35 times, but also claims to be equal with God. So, so John corrects these lies by saying that he is God's son, God's son, and that he's equal with God, and he was always here. John stresses that Jesus was with, the, was with God in the beginning. That's why if you ever wonder, why does John open like this? So let me start off. This is, so picture that happening, and this is what John has to say. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with, was with God. And the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. Period. <laughs> in him was life and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light. So that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. So he's clarifying who John the Baptist is too. He's not the light. He only bared witness to the light. Who is the light? Jesus. And, and he was always existing. He wasn't born 2,000 years ago. Born in the flesh. But he has always been Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh. And made his dwelling among us. You can see him saying that to Sarah this. In your face, Gnosticism. <laughs> we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him. He cried out, saying, This is the one I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Out of his fullness, we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God but the only, but the one and only Son, 
who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father has made him known. Period. Heresies. Many, this is something, a problem today. Many have fallen into the trap that Jesus was a holy man. You can get somebody to agree, yeah, Jesus existed. He was a holy man. There's different religions like that. And once it sound like Christianity, that's that Gnosticism. Sounds very much like Christianity. If you don't pay attention, if you're kind of not enough, you go, oh, yeah, Jesus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It says, or some say he's a miracle worker, a prophet. The main difference is that we believe that Jesus is much more than this. He's much more. If Jesus is not God, then we are still lost in our sins. If Jesus isn't God, we are foolish. We're wasting our time today. If he's just those things that we said. But amen, he's not. Hallelujah, right? He is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. He is Emmanuel, God with us. He is the Messiah, our Savior and Lord. He was and is the perfect sacrifice offering. And he will be coming back again for his people and to establish his kingdom here on earth. He's coming back. He's alive. That's the difference. He's a living God. Now, the Gospel of John includes seven I am statements, which when they use the word I am, basically says that Jesus is equivalent with God. When he says I am, he's saying I am. I am. <laughs> they are intended to prove once and for all who Jesus is. John 6.35. The first I am statement. John 6.35. And I don't know if you want to try to keep up with me. Just write them down because I'm going to be bouncing really fast here. John 6, chapter 35. I am the bread of life. I am. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. John 8, 12, and chap uh, chapter 8, verse 12, and chapter 9, verse 5. Sorry, John chapter 8, verse 12, and John chapter 9, verse 5. I am the light of the world. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of the light of life. This man was not kidding around. I am. So when everyone says that Jesus did not declare himself God, here it is. I am. When they say I am, that equates himself with God. And the, and the Jews at the time knew that, and they wanted to stone him for that. They wanted to crucify him because they, that was heresy in their eyes. Because he was saying he was equal to God when he said, I am. It says, I am the gate. John chapter 10, verse 7. Then Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep, or I am the gate of the sheep. John chapter 10, 11. Number four says, I am the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. John chapter eleven twenty five. 25, it says, I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. John 14, 6, truth, or I am number six. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I love that one. Just says it all. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. No one can get to the Father except through me. Why? Because he's God. John chapter 15, 1, I am the true vine. I am. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. These are significant sayings. It says Christ, claim, Christ claims are unique here. No other religious leader has proclaimed anything like them. Some have tried to help the hungry. I'm sorry. Some have tried to help the hungry find bread, but Jesus said, "I am the bread of life." The Son gives physical light to the world, but the Son of God stated, "I am the light." 
the only source of the world's spiritual light. The only source of the world's spiritual light. Not one of the sources, not many sources, but the only source. He claimed to be the only gate or door to the Heavenly Father. He is the only way you can get to the Father. There's no, this is a huge and comparable claim. This is huge. Jesus declared that all who believe in him would live forever. Hallelujah. Has any other spiritual leader dared to claim such a thing? Many have searched for truth, but Jesus said, I am the truth. I can always say that. You can't handle the truth. Sorry. It's always in my head forever. He alone is a spiritual standard that shows what is true and false. While many types of vines produce a variety of fruit, Jesus claimed to be the true vine. He said that spiritual life comes only from abiding, living in his presence, connecting, abiding, being part of him. And that all who do not relate to him as the vine will be cast into the fire. Jesus' claims are unique, placing him at the level of God alone. His seven I am statements in John's gospel provide important evidence to support Christ's deity. They lay the groundwork for the faith that Jesus is God in the flesh, a truth on which the rest of the New Testament is based. Without that, the New Testament, that's the foundation that, God, that Jesus is God. Aside from these seven statements, Jesus also used the word I am in Exodus 3.14. So if you're like, why does I am equate to God? Well, if you remember when Moses asked God for his name, what did he say? I am. Well then, if God said it then, isn't it true when he, God said it again? I am. This was related to Yahweh, the Old Testament name of God. That's what I am. In John, 8, Jesus, in John 8, Jesus claimed, I tell you the truth. Before Abraham was born. So Jesus is saying, I was alive before Abraham. I am. He gave himself the title of God, I am, from the Old Testament scriptures. That is, he claimed to be God. This so horrified and sensed the Jews that they wanted to stone him. And that's found in John chapter 8, verse 59, that they were so horrified by his statement. Why were they so horrified if it was just saying, I'm a prophet or I'm a healer? They could settle for that, maybe. I am God. I am God. That's what got them. I believe the scriptures of God are God-breathed and inspired by the Holy Spirit as you guys do too. So 2 Timothy 3, chapter 3, 16 to 17, says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. 2 Peter chapter 1, 20 to 21. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but the holy man of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. To close up, I want to just come back to full circle where I started. Just because they were inspired by the Holy Spirit, this doesn't mean they were possessed or robots when they wrote the word or wrote the scriptures. God chose these men to write the scriptures. God used different men with different backgrounds and experiences to tell a story. This is not concerning, but encouraging for me and for us. If God uses different and flawed people to tell his story, then he can use you and me. Amen. I'll say that again. If God uses different and flawed people to tell his story, then he can use you and me. These people were not perfect. Don't get that in your head. It is crazy about God. In closing, let us consider this. Each of us are very different from one another. We have different jobs, upbringings, cultures, languages, experiences, personalities. That's wonderful. That enables God to reach many different types of people. If we were all the same, we would be limited in who we could reach. We shouldn't all strive to be the same or must be perfect before we open our mouths to tell about Jesus or to be used by God. 
God can use you right now, today. We can all share the gospel of Jesus Christ because God has rescued us all. And we all have a different story to tell. Amen? Amen. Amen. Lord, I just thank you, Father, for your word. Lord, that you would use this to uh, encourage us that we can rely on your word. So we don't have to be afraid of skeptics or people that disagree with us. That there's always an answer to your scriptures. Lord God, and Lord God, that we can be bold to declare your truths, Lord. Bless everybody today and this week in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.